Welcome to the Virtual Millionaire Show, the ultimate destination for all things real estate investing. I'm your host, Michael McDonald, a real estate investor based out of Las Vegas. And I am on a mission to help you scale your real estate business. This podcast is designed to educate, motivate, and inspire you on your journey to becoming a virtual millionaire in the world of real estate. We bring to you experts from successful owners across the country who share actionable advice that you can implement immediately. Our goal is to equip you with the knowledge and tools needed to launch and grow your real estate investing business, paving the way for financial success. Before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Property Pros Marketing. Property Pros Marketing drives motivated seller leads directly to you through digital marketing. Check them out at propertyprosmarketing.com. Now, let's get started with another episode of The Virtual Millionaire Show. All right, guys, coming back to you with another episode of The Virtual Millionaire Show, and I have with me today, Mr. David Olds. How you doing, brother? Doing amazing, man. Thanks so much for having me on. Of course, man. Excited to have you and really get to know a little bit more about your start because mm-hmm. I know what you got going on now and yeah. I, run in, I run into you at quite a few events. So excited mm-hmm. to see or hear for the listeners yeah. uh, what else you got cooking. So so kind of take people back, man. Like, who's, Who are you and, and how'd you get into the, this wild world of real estate? Yeah, man. Probably like a lot of people fell into it backwards. Yeah, I feel like I don't have some crazy special story. You know, I wasn't dropped out of an airplane. I wasn't on drugs and in rehab. I mean, I was just kind of a normal kid. My parents lived just north of Boston in Massachusetts. So kind of grew up. I was a Boy Scout, went to Catholic school, did, did all of those things. My parents weren't super rich, but they worked really, really hard. And I think I got a lot of that work ethic from them. And one of the things that <clears throat> my dad and, and mom like to do is they were always like remodeling their house and updating and adding additions and just doing stuff. And as a kid, <clears throat> I was very roped into all of that and had to do so many hours of chores every day, like very old school Catholic kind of stuff. And I, I'll be honest, man, I really hated it. <laughs> and, uh, I remember being a kid, like raking the ground. We had this acre yard on the New Hampshire border and we rake a lot of leaves up there, man. I would be like, when I grew up, mm, I'm not going to make my kids do this, this, this kind of stuff. And I'm going to live in a condo. And, you know, the weird thing is, is you, of course, become your parents. Right. So, you know, growing up, I went to college, got a degree in criminal justice, which now I never use except when I'm dealing with my tenants and ended up in <laughs> my dad got laid off. So the whole family moved to Florida right as I was graduating college. And I went to work for a, a home supply company, kind of very similar to Home Depot and Lowe's, but just regional to Florida at the time. And being around contractors and people fixing up their houses was something that was at least a little bit familiar to me. So fast forward to 2002, I got married. My wife and I bought our first house. What do you do when you buy a house that has pink carpet and a bunch of other stuff? You do the stuff that you've lived your whole life doing and that you do in your daily work. So we tore out the carpet, put in laminate, took out the sliding glass doors, put in French doors, put up some crown molding, replaced all the baseboards and, and the casings around the doors. And, you know, just fixed the house up the way we wanted it to be. And then about two years later, I got transferred to a different location. So we put the house up for sale and made like a little over $50,000. And my realtor's like, well, you don't have to pay taxes on it because you lived in the house. It's a homestead exemption. So I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So I bought this other house and this was like the worst house in a beautiful neighborhood. Exactly what you're looking for as an investor. So I spent about the next two years fixing that one up and we did like a lot of rehab there. I brought in 20 loads of dirt to level out the grass and sod and we just did everything. Complete rehab inside, new kitchen cabinets, the whole thing. And sold that one like 30 months later and made a little over 100000 So I'm like, wow, man, pretty cool, right? I need to figure this out. So I was at the airport in Orlando waiting on someone to come in. And I'm in the little bookstore killing some time. And I pick up Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is the most cliche thing ever. But I did and read it because it's a great read. And if any of you guys haven't read it, you definitely should. But uh, um, yeah, at the end of the book, Kiyosaki says, hey, if you want to learn about oil, go do this. If you want to learn about real estate, go find like a meetup group or a RIA, Real Estate Investment Association, something like that, because there wasn't the internet, right? There wasn't a million YouTube videos and podcasts and all that type of stuff. So I did, so I found one in Orlando, got super involved, you know, went to all the classes, all the weekend seminars, did some coaching, mentoring, all of those types of things, and just learned more about the business. And my wife and I, even though we worked full time, we started 
started rehabbing houses on the side, not like a ton, but a couple a year. And, you know, that gave us a nice kind of side income. But what was happening in the late 2000s was the market was starting to go down a little bit. And initially we didn't realize how bad it was getting, but we knew something was going on. So we kind of wanted to elevate our investing and we're like, oh, well, we want to buy apartments, right? Or, you know, 10 units, eight units, four units, whatever. We want to start buying some bigger stuff to buy and hold. Level it up. Level it up. Like every single person playing Monopoly. We want to go from single families up to bigger houses. So we knew the market was getting a little squirrely down in, in Florida, Central Florida, especially. It was getting really expensive. So we're like, well, let's look at some other markets where we might be able to do this. So we started investigating a bunch and we were going to, you know, I went to this one boot camp in Boston talking about emerging markets. So talking about like market cycles and stuff. So I was looking all over the Southeast, Huntsville, you know, Birmingham, Montgomery, up in Kentucky, Louisville and stuff. Anyways, found Chattanooga and it was this really great market that hadn't taken much of a dip during, you know, what was the beginning of the recession then. So I'm like, okay, great. We're going to relocate to Chattanooga. We're going to move. Initially, we were just going to buy properties here, but then we decided we're going to move. So I get this last house. And we bought it in, I think it was August of 2008. And I'm like, okay, like we're going to do one more house. We're going to make a bunch of money and then we're going to get out of town. So I bought this house, man. And you tell me if you think this was a deal. I bought it. It was a probate, a very typical central Florida house, brick, you know, with stucco rancher, three bedroom, two bath with a two car garage. So I bought it for 97,000, right? Well, an identical house had just sold one block over two blocks down, but like two blocks diagonal for 214. So I'm like, great, 97, like I'm in the money. I should be able to sell this and make 90 or 100 grand. And then I'm going to shoot up to Chattanooga. We're going to have some seed money. We're going to be good. So I go in there, it's August. And back then I was not as skinny as you, but younger and had a lot more energy. So, you know, putting down tiles, scraping popcorn, put together the kitchen cabinets. I made my own laminates, which was kind of cool. So I get done around November. I call my realtor and she's like, yeah, you know, we don't want to probably list this right now because it's holidays. You're going to get a bunch of days on market. So let's not do let's not list it right now. Why don't you wait till January? I said, oh, well, that makes perfect. That makes perfect sense. So January comes around early January and I call her I'm like, hey, Shana, got the house. She's like, great. I'll be right over. So she comes over and she walks in. She's like, man, this looks really good. I'm like, I know. She's like, you did a great job. I'm like. I know. I'm like, what do you think we can sell it for? Now, again, 2009, no Facebook, no internet, nothing, right? It's a notebook, right? And she starts flipping through pages back and forth. And she's like, well, this one sold for this and that, and this one over here sold. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, this is bad. And I'm like, well, what do you think we can sell this for? Oh, probably 147. One block over, two blocks down, 214. She goes, yeah, that was then. I'm like, that was six months ago. And that's how fast the market had corrected in Florida. And it kept going. So I'm like, well, that's crazy. I can't sell it for that. That's ridiculous, right? Like the worst new investor mistake ever. And I'm still consider myself at this point like a new investor. I'm like, my house is better than that. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face anymore. But yeah, yeah, but my house is better. She's like, well, yeah. But no, these were all foreclosures and this is what houses are selling for. And nobody can get a bank loan anymore. So the only people buying are investors and they can just pay whatever they want for them. So I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> well, this is a problem because even though I made a bunch of money, like by now my wife had been laid off because the market started tanking even more. Like I had a job, but I told my company I was leaving. And the only reason they kept me on was because I was still servicing some accounts. I was doing outside sales for 84 Lumber. Otherwise, they'd have let me go. So yeah, the market was just in turmoil. So I'm like, well, that's crazy. I can't do that. I'll do 154, maybe 159. I can't remember exactly what I did. And she's like, okay, because she was a listing agent, right? They don't care. They just want to put their sign in the yard, and, you know, get out of your house. So we go a month, not a call, nothing. Like even $60,000 cheaper than what something had sold for six months ago, not even a call, man. Wow. So February comes around. I'm like, hey, all right, if I lower it to 147, do you think it'll work? She's like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, well, the market's bad. I'm like, well, yeah, what do you think we can do? She's like, oh, maybe 135. I'm like, a month ago, it was 147. She's like, okay, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> I'm like, well, let's go to 147. Maybe I said 145. And that got a couple calls, but not even a showing, right? Wow. And I had kids at the time, right? So you know what it's like trying to keep your house up every day, thinking you're going to have showings at any point. So this is wearing on us. March comes around, it's again, same question. I'm like, 
oh my God, what, what are we going to do? She's like, I don't know. What's the best you think you could do? I'm like, 142. Let's put it at 142 and see if we even get any calls. And we got a couple showings, but still no offers. So the last couple of years when we hear people crying on Facebook about, oh, the market's so bad. I'm like, the market is not bad. That was I, was, I was waiting for you to relate to that because yeah. nobody even has a clue who didn't go through 2008. I mean, I was in high school in 2008. So yeah. I, I have no idea, but like hearing yeah. that, it's just like mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So how much did you have into that house then? We bought it for 97. It was hard because I did all the labor myself. So I maybe had eight, maybe 10 grand and stuff that was on my credit cards. But what I try to explain to people is that was a real crash and it kept going. Like that wasn't where it stopped. It just kept going. I think that house ended up selling, well, a lot of things. I'll tell you what we did with it. But the way I explain to people is it's like watching a fat kid chase a tennis ball down the hill, right? No matter how hard the fat kid runs, like that tennis ball is moving faster. And you just, you can't get ahead of the price decreases, right? Right. So when you get into a falling market, you got to take your best shot right then. Take the hit. One chance with to hit the top yeah. of the market. Yeah, because it just keeps going. It just keeps stopping. And what we realize now, if you'd have gone back to Aria in 2005, six and seven, even the big thing they were teaching is, hey, man, market to pre foreclosures, pre foreclosures, pre foreclosures. It never freaking dawned on anybody. Oh, my God. What is the bank going to do with all these properties are taken back? Like it never even occurred to anybody. I've talked to Ron Legrand, like all these guys that were like, it never occurred to anybody that, oh my God, one day the bank is going to have so many of these, they're just going to flood the market with them. So interesting now to go back and, and think about and see how it all happened. But March comes around, now we're in April and like, I'm ready to go in June. So now I'm starting to get a little panicky. So I'm like, well, I got to figure something out. Like I can't keep, you know, I did ask her, I'm like, what do you think? She's like, maybe 120, 125. I'm like, oh my God, by the time I sell this thing, I'm all broken even. I remembered I've been through a million real estate classes over the six or eight years. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just sell this with owner financing. Maybe I'll sell it on a lease option. So I went out and I got some bandit signs and I wrote, no banks needed, owner will finance, 5K down, Deltona. And I, it was in, because it was 742 Trafalgar Street in Deltona. So I put these signs out everywhere all over town. It still took me two months to find a, a tenant buyer. And she came in and put $5,000 down and I was renting it to her. I remember I was making like $12 a month, some ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous amount of cash flow, right? Like it was my first rental ever. I did such a great job on it. And uh, yeah, so that was it. I like packed up my stuff. Like she moved in, we moved out and she was a nurse with a family and we literally packed up everything. It was me, my wife, two boys and three fat dogs. And we moved to, to Chattanooga. Now my brother came with us and we had known we were coming to Chattanooga. So we were kind of going back and forth and we had already bought a duplex up here, sub two. So one of my trips up here, cause we were doing some marketing, some mailers and some signs and things. And I I had gone by and we had looked at this house in Chattanooga in the East Lake area, which is, if you're not from Chattanooga, you don't know, it's not the best area. It's not like the worst, but it's not the best area. And, you know, I'd negotiated to buy this deal with no money down or maybe a thousand bucks down. It wasn't much, but the house had been empty for a while. The guy had gotten married, had two houses. It was built in like 1908. So not new, not modern, no AC, you know, it wasn't great, but it had been like two months. And when we contracted it, I had no idea that this was going to be the house I ended up having to move into. But it was, you know, it's just the way timing worked out. So we drive 577 miles, U-Haul cars, you know, moving all of our crap up here, come straight up, go to the closing and go directly to, the, to this house that I haven't seen in like six or eight weeks and get there. Now it's like seven o'clock at night. It's June, early June in Chattanooga and Tennessee. It's hot, it's humid, it's miserable, everybody's tired. It's everything I can do at this point to drag in a couple of mattresses. I think we might've gone to McDonald's and got some burgers for the kids. And I'm like, oh my God, this house is terrible. <laughs> This is really bad. I'm like, what on earth did I do? Right. Did you look at it first or did you just like, buy we were it? there? No, like I was there and we put it under contract, but I didn't know six weeks down the road this would be the house I ended up having to move into and move my family here. And one of the electrical poles was out. So half the power didn't work in the house. Like a door wasn't completely closed. So there was like a couple of mice running around. It was terrible. And I don't know if you've ever been that exhausted. And I remember laying there, dude. Like with this fan going, it was like, it was like the worst night ever. I laid there on this mattress with just a sheet, sweating my butt off and thinking about, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done? Like I had a nice house. I could have got another job. We could have figured it out if we stayed in Florida. Why on earth would I bring my wife and 
two kids and three fat dogs up here to a city where we knew nobody. Like we didn't, I didn't have family there. Like I didn't know anybody. We just strictly moved there for real estate. I kind of knew one realtor um, that we would see when we came up to look at houses. And dude, that was like the worst night ever. Like I cried myself to sleep that night. I'm like, guy, I'm a terrible husband, terrible father. This is the worst decision I've ever made. Like, I don't even know. I don't even know. You know what though, David, man, like this is the type of story. These are the type of stories though that people need to hear because you were willing to do whatever it took to yeah. make your career in real estate. And like so much so that you said, Hey, I'm moving to Chattanooga, mm-hmm. but I can't help to think and, and ask if you look back at that Florida house mm-hmm. and you're counting on this profit, but it ended up selling for, they would have sold for a lot less. You, yeah. you probably would have taken a loss. So you decided, Hey, I'm not going to take a loss. Like a lot of people don't realize. And I feel like a lot of people learn this in that market is like, Hey, we can get money down. We can sell it on contract. We can yeah. lease option, whatever. What did you sell that house for? And do you still own it today? I'm so I curious. don't. So kind of this ties into a little bit later. Like we got really good at buying properties with owner finance. I went through a couple of tenants down there and I got to the point where a tenant wasn't paying. And now I'm a distant landlord. I'm trying to get them to pay. I have someone I know kind of going over there to check on them. Like, oh, we're two months behind, but we're going to pay. And of course, at the time, I didn't have the money for the mortgage to be floating that mortgage too. And I worked out a keys for deed, deed in lieu with the lender. And then they ended up just foreclosing on it. So I ended up having a property get foreclosed on. I think it ended up selling at like 97,000 or something from the bank. So it's, it, it continued to drop. But yeah, I ended up, you know, I got my 5,000, probably not even $1,000 in cash flow over the years. But yeah, it ended up getting foreclosed on. That was a terrible mistake. You know, it took me years to dig out of that credit hole. And, and then you moved out there buying this property subject to in Chattanooga, yeah. thinking that, oh, this is a great deal. I yeah. assume you realize, oh, this is more than I expected and the market isn't getting any better. So yeah, I, I, you kind of were, your only option was to live there, right? Move yeah. There. I mean, well, just because the way it all, the timing of everything, the way that it, I, you know, honestly, I'm going to move to Chattanooga. I don't even know what my plan was. I guess I thought we were going to rent a house. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I said it's always 2020 and it's funny because yeah. I moved across the country from Nebraska on my birthday. Yeah. Like, going on four years, five years ago. And looking back, I'm just like, what in the world? Yeah. Was I thinking like, how did that make any sense? I didn't have any mo- like any money really in the bank. Yeah. I did that. But um, hey, yeah. it all works out, right? So I look back and I'm like, you know, you see these memes on Facebook, burn the boots, burn the bridge. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. And it's so motivational. Do not do it if you have a wife and kids. <laughs> it's an incredibly irresponsible thing to do. Now, for the people it works for, are the people who are built for that. The entrepreneurs, the hustlers who have that ability to focus and literally, yeah, I got up the next morning and I'm like, okay, we're going to figure this out. You know, we're going to, I'm going to go get some more bandit signs and we're going to put out, we buy houses signs and we're going to wholesale because the thing was I had tried to wholesale in Florida and it never worked. Right. Like it didn't, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out because I had a great job and was flipping houses. Right. I had no need to wholesale. So now I've done like 1500 wholesale deals. And when I tell people that they think it's crazy, but I'm like, it just didn't work, but it had to work when we got here. And we did almost 30 houses that first year because man, I was motivated. It was the only thing I thought about in the morning. It was the thing I did all day, which was driving for dollars, looking at houses, networking, talking to people. And it was the last thing I thought about at night. And I was either committed or too dumb to quit. I don't know which one or some combination of both. Yeah. And that's literally what it took to, to get that business off the ground. Man, that's really powerful. And for everybody listening, like, I know you're probably thinking like, man, David's crazy. But like you and I talked to a lot of real estate investors and a sure. lot of us, we all had our backs against the wall at one point in time. It seems like it, we just had to figure it out. And when you have that, you figure it out right? You do whatever it takes. Yeah. Nobody lucks into real estate and just like magically becomes the biggest wholesaler in the country. Like everybody comes from some kind of weird trauma or desperation or, you know, I'm going to make this work. Right. I mean, there are a lot of people who you can definitely wholesale part time and it'd be like a little hobby. I'm going to do two or three deals a year. Cool. But to turn it into a real business is, you know, it's not difficult. It's a very process driven. You do the same thing over and over again, but you got to have a lot of do not quit in you. You, you really do, man, especially with the ups and downs. And mm-hmm. over the last couple of years, I mean, I, I would imagine you've seen a lot of people um, quit. Uh, a lot of people yeah. change careers, and I've seen a lot sure. of people do the same. And I get it. Like, it's mm-hmm. been challenging, but challenging compared to what, right? Yeah. I- 
it's funny. My mother says to me sometimes, you work so hard. I'm like, I sit in an office all day you know, I watch a lot of squirrel videos. I have a great team that does it. Yeah, like, oh, we're not working. We could be out digging ditches. It could be a lot worse. But yeah, for sure, you're absolutely right. A lot of people left the, the industry, the business in the last couple of years, which is shocking to me wow. because if you could find a way to wholesale a house at the top of the market where sellers want the most money, right? Like that to me is hard. When you get into a down market where sellers are struggling, like those are the easiest deals to get, right? It was that window though. It was the yeah. gap in there sure. where the expectations were high yeah. of the seller, but our, the investor prices were yeah. still down here. So that was a, it was a mm -hmm. gap that people had a hard time pivoting to. Yeah which it was the ones who pivoted to things like novations, which I know you've been pretty sure. big into. So yeah. where did that, like, where did that take you? Obviously we're, we're building up to what, sure. what the sign is behind you here of a transpired, but where did that go from there? Yeah. I mean, just kind of real quick, cause it'll take a long time, but yeah, we started wholesaling. We were absolutely just dominating our city. We were really the first people to be full-time wholesalers here. So we're, we're doing a lot of wholesaling rolled that into, I started buying properties with owner finance, built a portfolio of over a hundred properties doing that. And then came back to wholesaling. I, I brought in a, a young guy, his name was Justin to be a partner with me. And you know, that way I could rehab and wholesale at the same time. That again, we grew it up, we grew it bigger again. Then I brought in this other partner and now there's four of us, right? Him, Justin, my wife and me. So splitting deals four ways is not as fun as splitting them two ways or even three ways. So at that point was when we decided, hey, we need to go out to other cities, right? And virtual wholesaling wasn't even really a word back in 2016, 2015. So, you know, we just were like, oh, we'll just market to Birmingham. That's close enough. We can drive there if we absolutely had to. Let's market to St. Louis and Louisville and just some other markets like that. And we got absolutely got our butts kicked. Like I found every way there was, every way that there was to lose marketing money. <laughs> There's an infinite number. And I think we covered all of them. We made just a ton of mistakes, but in going through that, we figured it out. And Nationwide Property Liquidators became one of the biggest wholesalers in the country for a few years because, you know, we were in 115 markets just doing a lot of deals. And kind of that led into a little bit of coaching. And the thing that I really focused on in my business was the second half, the dispositions and really the transactions. And like transactions didn't really seem like a thing. It was just that thing that we did. Right. It, it didn't really seem like a, a separate piece of the business. And it's a little bit longer story, but fell backwards into transactions during COVID. You know, a lot of people slashed their staff and admin people were the first people to go. But this actually, this office I'm sitting in was we our transaction coordinators. And some friends of mine said, hey, do you still have some TCs? Can you help me close these deals? And that's how it started. We really built Easy REI closings for me and for some of our friends, for like Nick Perry and Corey Geary, just some of the bigger wholesalers that are out there that were friends of mine. And we're like, oh, well, this works. This is a thing. This is really needed. There's no education on it. You know, there's no service provider that really helps to do this. Whereas opposed to like marketing where there's a million PPC and PPL and direct demand. There's just, there's so much stuff on the acquisition side. There's very little to help people sell their deals and get them closed. You know, this normal thing where the guru will say, just go find a title company and they'll do it for you. And we know the reality is not all title companies are the same. Not all of them want to do it. And nobody got into this business to learn what a monument of title is or where to find a, a bank who's closed their records to get a mortgage release, right? Like all the weird stuff that we have to go through. So that was why we looked at it and we said, oh, I, I think we can do this where we can start a company and maybe we can get 10 or 15 clients and it'll be great. And the reality is it just apparently it was far more needed than I thought. And it's absolutely blown up over the last couple of years. How many clients do you guys have today? 218, I think is the number. That's crazy, man. And as somebody who also does virtual wholesaling myself, mm -hmm. a lot of us underestimate what it's actually going to take to manage transactions yeah. in other markets. And yeah. one of the biggest pain points that I experience personally that a lot of others do too, is what title company are we going to use now? Yeah. Oh, and who do we go to for this? And if you have a connection like Easy REI Closings, Mm -hmm. You guys know immediately because you've worked in every market across the country and it's like yeah. it's the best thing ever to have that connection. Yeah. You know, not again, not all title companies are the same. So, you know, somebody who do a wholesale may not do a novation. They may do a novation, but not sub two. They may do sub two, but not a wrap or a land contract or installment sale or, or whatever it is. And we were very very committed to that from day one, right? We knew who we were going to be. We knew, even though nobody had ever done this before, so we were sort of creating it out of thin air. I know that you are gonna come along and you may do a deal in Nebraska and Montana, but you may get a deal in Florida too, right? So we have to be in all 50 states. And that presents its own 
crazy set of challenges. So now you've got to have basically five or six title companies in every single state so that we can handle every transaction type because I never know what somebody's going to send me every day. You know, we get anywhere from 20 to 30 contracts per day from our clients. And then not only do we have to be in every state, but we have to have our coordinators trained to do all transaction types. So that was kind of our, you know, I don't know, guiding light or whatever it was. Our mantra in the very beginning was, hey, we're going to make sure that we can do these things and do them better than anybody else. Yeah, And there's so many moving parts with creative oh, deals. There's so yeah. many moving parts with innovation. And a seller will get, I mean, we've had deals die um, mm -hmm. because the communication wasn't there yeah. before we actually got a process in place for mm -hmm. it. I love the structure though, like how you help people. Cause what a lot of people underestimate is like, oh, I'll just have a VA do my transaction coordinator. Yeah. I'll just have a staff member do it, but they underestimate like what that actually takes to execute at the highest level. So can you mm. talk about sure. like your guys' structure for how it's a no brainer for investors to, to work? Yeah. With so the thing I want to talk about the VA thing, cause I hear that a lot, like, oh, I'll just hire a VA. I'm like, okay, you 100%, you can do that. First off, you as the business owner, should be working on your business, not in your business. We understand that. I said, but you're going to get a VA. So being a transaction coordinator is not just some checklist, right? There's just no like checklist or I'm going to get these three things and everything is going to be fine. Right. So we do have a intake form. I think it's like five pages where we ask every single possible question that could come up. And, you know, last year we did 2,202 files and we closed $238 million in deals. So we understand that like there are a lot of things that can come up, right? Death, divorce, you know, probate, taxes, maybe it's a mobile home, you need serial numbers. Is there a tenant? Who do you got to get the lease? There's just a lot of stuff there. But that even that five pages, if I was to give that to you, it's just where we start, right? It's where I collect the information and go, oh, there's going to be a problem here. Now this is a new, like now this new list or SOP of things that we have to collect. So when you get this VA and I'm not anti-VA, I use them for marketing and stuff. But the last thing I'm going to do is have somebody from the Philippines or Egypt or somebody with an accent who doesn't speak great English call Mrs. Smith in West Virginia and go, great, I'm working with Michael on this deal. And yeah, and I need your, the last five digits of your social security number and your wiring instructions. That's the end of your deal. Let's, so yeah. you're better off doing it yourself than having a VA do it, right? That's a terrible idea. Like I tell people, like, don't work with me, but please, for your own, like, don't go get a VA to do this. It's not going to work. And then the other mistake I see people make is, oh, I'm just going to have my dispo guy do, do it. I'm like, okay, cool. Let me explain to you, what did you hire that dispo guy to do? to sell, right? Like we go out and we're looking for a certain personality type. In Dispo, I want a guy that's gonna, or a gal, right? I've had a lot of success with uh, women Dispo managers. I want them to go out there and push and fight and tug of war and, you know, great. So now I'm gonna take them off of that job and tell them, you go find a title company in West Virginia that will do innovation. They're not built for that. That's not their personality type. It's like, You've got Tom Brady's on your, you own the football, the Patriots or the Tampa Bay Bucks. And you have Tom Brady. Hey, Tom, we don't have a game this Tuesday. Can, would you mind going up to accounting and helping them write some checks? I'm like, why would you take your star player off the field when he should be doing the thing that he should be doing? Right. So again, in either of those scenarios, the owner is the best person to be doing this. Right. You should not be taking your dispo people and stopping them. Cause here's, what's going to happen at the end of the week. You're going to go, Hey, Joey, why didn't you sell those three properties? Oh, well, I was in a Facebook group trying to figure out who is the best title company in Virginia. And then I had to call a bunch of people and that's crazy, right? That's just not, you know, either you do it or you go out and try to find somebody who understands transactions and bring them into your office. But now you're in the, I got to put out ads. I got to stop what I'm doing to interview. I've got to hire them. Hopefully they accept. I've got to bring them in and train them because there are no investment, you know, TCs just sitting on the shelf where you can just go buy them, right? You might get an agent or somebody who worked at a title company, but you even this is who we hire, but I still have to bring them in and train them on what you want as a client, right? Wholesale deals, sub two, like I've hired so many of them and I start explaining assignments to them and then they're like, oh my God, I've never heard of that before. Are you sure that's legal? I'm like, yep. You know, so even if you hire your own person, you're going to have to do this training. You're going to have to manage them. You're going to, you're going to have to do stuff, right? It's not just hands off. And that's a mistake I see people make in all parts of their business is, oh, I'm going to hire this PPC person. or I'm going to hire this bookkeeper. I'm going to, you know, and they just assume that, oh, I've hired them. You know, my problem solved. Yeah. And that doesn't even factor like employment, W2, payroll, taxes on that. Like there's a significant cost to hiring team. I have 10 plus on my yeah. team. And so to have 
a turnkey system of experts that's yeah. such a it's like such a competitive advantage and and the title of this is to streamline your transaction and close more deals yeah you have your acquisitions focus on closing more deals your disposition on juicing your deals and have yeah. a transaction expert on yeah through. it's a matter of making a deal get to the finish line and dying yeah the one thing we tell our clients, I want you to do more deals and make more money and have more freedom, right? So, you know, by letting us handle the transactions, like I want you, the less involved you can be, the better. I want you out getting your next deal, selling that deal, right? Like keeping that wheel turning, just, you know, kick the contracts over to us. And we want it to be as we call it like concierge, hands off white glove service. Like we will do everything there is. Of course, if there's an issue, we contact you, right? We're, we're very, you know, driven for communication and transparency. But, you know, I want your business to grow because the more you grow, the more deals you're going to send to me. Right. So it becomes, you know, very beneficial for both of us. 100 percent. So, guys, check out Easy RAI Closings. I'll drop a link in this as well so you guys can uh, take advantage of that. And then, David, you work with a lot of like mega wholesalers, um, yeah. right, is the term that I've heard used before. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, people that do 40 and people that do two deals a month. Right. We've got all we've got the whole spectrum. Yep. So you don't have to be right. But a lot of people who are watching this, like they may be in that couple deals a month and they may be burning the candle at both ends and they, they yeah. need somebody to really take that admin so they can focus on doing more deals, making more money and have more fun. Mm. I always talk about unique ability. Like I don't want to be doing paperwork ever. No. And you know, like one of the things that this is what I realized. So I'm a wholesaler by nature. I did it for 15 years. So I consider myself really a wholesaler. But in the beginning, the thing that that messed me up and I probably would have had a much bigger company had I learned this earlier is I thought I, I had to do everything myself. And that's maybe a little narcissism or a little just wholesaler hustler sickness that, that a lot of us have. And we think, oh, nobody can do it better than me. I'm the smartest. Nobody will work as hard as me. And a lot of that is true. Like, I'm really great at some things. You're really great at some things in your business, but we're not great at everything, right? And, you know, it's the, the faster you can get to that point where, oh, I'm going to outsource to the very best, you know, the better your life will be, because now you're able to focus on the parts of your business that really matter. In my case, I went to somebody who was really great at PPC and I'm like, hey, dude, I'll come train your team on Dispo. Will you train me on PPC? He's like, yeah, absolutely. And I was in Phoenix, Arizona, sitting next to this guy at a hotel and at a table. And I knew five minutes in there was zero chance I was ever going to be doing PPC. It's so complicated. My brain doesn't work. Like, I'm like, like I sat and let him go for 30 minutes. I'm like, bro. I got this, 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 who should I hire? Right, right. <laughs> who should I hire for this? Because I'm not going to be able to do this well. And I don't want to lose money at it. And the same way with your transactions, you think you're going to save money by doing it yourself, but literally, what's it costing you, right? If you're dinging around with a title company trying to track down death certificates or lost trucks to trust documents or a mortgage release from some bank that's gone out of business 10 years ago. Like, what are you not doing? Well, you're not working on your company. You're not fixing your marketing. You're not talking to your sellers. You're not talking to your buyers. I promise you, it is costing you money. And then there's the easy stuff where you think, you know, some title company tells you a deal can't be closed and you accept that and you just take your $30,000 deal and throw it. How many times have you heard that and then actually oh, close the deal? Countless times. Like countless times. I mean, it happened to me when I was here in Chattanooga. You know, just it was early, early days. I was going to this the investor friendly title company, like the investor friendly title company. And I had this one attorney and we called him Dr. No, because it felt like everything I took in there was no. And I remember this one day I went in and I just come from this old lady's house and I went in there and I'm like, bam, new contract. And his name was Jeremy. And he's like, Oh, Davey, you're gonna have this has got a her husband's dead. You're gonna have to go through probate and you're gonna have to you're gonna do all the things. And I'm like, like I'd had enough and it was just a day I was tired. I'm like, dude, come on. I just came from this lady's house. There's, I, she's 95 years old. She can barely walk. She's not hiring attorneys. Like there's gotta be something else we can do. I promised this lady would get this done. So he's sitting there looking at me and I'm looking at him and I'm like, oh shit, I should not have yelled at my attorney. <laughs> and finally he goes, yeah, man, I guess if you could do this and get this and do this other thing and get these two affidavits, I guess we could close it. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But what about like the other 20 deals over the last two years where I've, we couldn't do them, right? So what I learned is, yeah, not always, but a lot of times there is another way to get things done. Not every state, but it's different state by state, but learning to ask good questions and being persistent and just 
understanding the process will go a long ways. And I always tell people, if I can help you close one more deal a quarter, four or five deals a year, the average deal is 18263 bucks. So five deals would be almost $100,000. I promise you, we are far less. Than, we're a fraction of that. What would you do in your business if you could pick up another 70 or 80 grand? Seriously. What could you do? What could you do with marketing? Right. Your average deal costs you four thousand dollars. So that would get you 20 more deals. Right. 20 more deals at 20,000. Right. Like the numbers by turning these small levers in your company, the way it'll grow is it's just incredible. That's great, man. And such an impact over so many mm -hmm. deals across the country. Yeah. Uh, what exactly what's the sentiment um, right now of, of investors out there in the marketplace who are doing a lot of wholesaling yeah. innovations. Have you seen pivots to yeah. more innovations over the last several years? Or? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Over 40% of our deals are innovations. We do a lot of innovation, probably more, far more innovations than anybody else in the country. Our team is really good at them. In fact, they don't honestly prefer innovations. They're, they're a lot of times cleaner deals, but yeah, wholesaling or the assignment deals have dropped just a little bit. Innovations have grown. I think we're in the 40s someplace. And then the rest are like, creative deals, sub two installment sales are getting very popular. That's the kind of thing just came out from Steve Trang and so much, yeah, out of South Carolina. So we're seeing a lot of that. We provide funding for people's transactional funding and stuff. So we're seeing more and more calls for that. People doing double closes and working, working that side of the business. But yeah, I definitely seeing more creative stuff too. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Well, this has been awesome, man. Well, this has been awesome, man. I do appreciate you for coming on here. And yeah, man, I know the people are going to get a ton of value from somebody like yourself. So appreciate that. I'm sorry to go long. I know we went a little bit longer than we had talked about, but yeah, man, it's an exciting time to be an investor. You know, the more times where you see regulation coming, if you can get past that and figure out the solution, opportunity is in the solutions. And I think opportunity is in the solutions. And I think it's a really good time to be a wholesaler. I think we're going to see some good stuff over the next year or two. And I'm bullish on wholesaling wholesaling. I love it, man. Guys, you heard it here first. David, thanks for coming on. And guys, if you got value from today, which I know you did, show some love, like, share, tell a friend and go check out Easy REI Closings. And with that, man, it's a wrap. All right, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm bullish on, on wholesaling. I love it, man. Well, yeah. guys, you heard it here first. David, thanks for coming on. And guys, if you got value from today, which I know you did, Show some love, like, share, tell a friend, and go check out Easy REI Closings. And with that, man, it's a wrap. All right, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm bullish on, on wholesaling. I love it, man. Guys, you heard it here first. David, thanks for coming on. And guys, if you got value from today, which I know you did, show some love, like, share, tell a friend, and go check out Easy REI Closings. And with that, man, that's it's a wrap. All right, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Learning to ask good questions and being persistent and just understanding the process. Boom. Another episode in the books. Thank you guys again for listening. Before I let you go, I just wanted to invite you to our Facebook group, Virtual Deal Makers. It's a perfect place to connect and collaborate with other like-minded real estate investors. And all you have to do is simply search Virtual Deal Makers on Facebook and apply to join the group. Thanks again to our sponsor, Property Pros Marketing, for supporting the show. Go ahead and check them out at propertyprosmarketing.com to elevate your lead generation. If you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps, and we greatly appreciate it. Share the podcast with your friends, and stay tuned for more valuable insights. Visit thevirtualmillionaires.com to see everything about the episode and connect with me. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, keep crushing those deals and building your real estate empire. This is Michael McDonald signing off from The Virtual Millionaire Show.